there are certain things that developers are going to continue to want to do through the command line. You never want to like displace a tool that they're already using, they're so familiar with. We do have design-minded people, but not professional designers. It's sort of like designing an OS, a UI, it's very extensible. The initial effort has to be really strong because otherwise you will get swayed by different opinions. And design by committee isn't always a nice thing. That's also another reason for being a desktop app is that it's super easy to adopt. Basically download it and double click, it opens and just installs Docker for you. That's like the future. You know, it's not like developers, enterprise people, consumers. It's just easy enough that any user can actually do it. Hi, I'm Steve. And I'm David, and you're listening to Don't Make Me Code, the bi-weekly series where we discuss developer experience and some of the unique challenges we face building developer-facing products. Don't Make Me Code is brought to you by Heavybit, a nine-month program for developer-facing startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. And if you're interested in being a guest on this show or if you have a specific topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us at dmmc at heavybit.com or on Twitter at Don't Make Me Code. We're calling this episode of Don't Make Me Code Environment Protection, and we're here with Sean Lee, who's lead product designer at Docker and one of the founders of Kitematic. Thank you. Thanks for being here with us. This is a really exciting conversation for me because we get to talk to a a product designer for a company like Docker. Yeah, it's it's good to be here. Kitematic is is a really interesting project for a bunch of reasons. I mean, it, it caught the interest of Docker. It's also proven a really novel bit of development environment technology, and so we're curious how it all got started. Yeah, it kind of uh, got started in the university dorm room. So I was a a student from University of Waterloo in Canada, and uh, the school actually offers like a pitch competition. So we had this idea around you know making development environments easier, and so then we pitched the idea and won. That's how um, we kind of got enough money to get started. Wow! And was it at all tied to Docker at that point? Uh, so Docker was actually what we used for the back end. At the time, Docker was you know version 0.3. And then we were on Hacker News and we were like, oh, this seems interesting. It could be a super useful technology to do what it wanted to do. So our ad- idea was essentially kind of like Dropbox for your code. You know, you get like a Dropbox-like icon uh, on your on your uh, task menu, and then you can put code in it. For example, Django, it will just spin up a container and then run it for you, and you can see it on the um, oh nice on the browser. And so you have your production environment there, and and kind of compiling for you and ready to go. Yeah, and then you know when when you edit the code, it will sync to the cloud uh, environment and then update right away. Nice. That's awesome, like a step beyond GitHub. It's not just committing the code, you're actually like all the CI and everything is kind of built into this one workflow. Yeah, so so you know that's like the future plan, right? At the time, but um, you know, at first our MVP was super simple, just syncing code to a remote server and then, you know, seeing the changes. And so from the beginning, it was implemented as a desktop application. You said the kind of like a Dropbox tray application. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cuz you know, Dropbox was obviously the inspiration. And so why the desktop application. Mm-hmm. So at the time, we actually didn't realize, you know, the power of of desktop application yet. At one point, you know, we used to pivot a lot, you know, and, and you know, as usually startups do. And then, you know, we we're talking to customers, and they start realizing what we're using underneath. Right? We talked to, you know, the Canadian Tire, the biggest retailer in Canada. They were looking for something like this, and they're like, "Oh, are you using Docker uh, underneath? We want to use that." So at the time, it, most of it is um, the product we have is in the cloud, right? Like an on-prem, you know, web browser setup. And then, you know, we we started thinking, it's like, oh, you, instead of abstracting away Docker, why don't we embrace it and then make it easier for the customers? And then we start, you know, brainstorming ideas, and it came across that you know having a desktop application is actually super beneficial. It's like you know the best platform. For, for developers because you know they can import their code super easily or they can open a directory instead of you know having to upload files in a browser you can also get a lot, a lot of access to their you know desktop so once your tool gets more powerful there's more uh, more things that you can do it's also super cool because we use uh, we use Chrome in uh, electron shell mm. and we wrote the the UI in react so that means uh, we only have to worry about 
you know, how the UI runs in that one browser instead of having to worry about browser compatibilities across the uh, board. Right. And it's yeah, so it's not something like a React Native. It's just a you know running in a web view in yeah. the Electron browser, right? And we make it feel as native as possible. All oh, right, nice. So it's a well, it's a true, it is you know a true desktop app in many ways, mm-hmm. but specifically the UI is a, it's a web UI. Yeah, yeah, and you know a lot of inspiration comes from you know the Atom editor by GitHub. Mm-hmm. Um, they're you know they're using the same technology. And so this whole bit was open sourced from the beginning. Yeah, well, we were working on it and then we mm-hmm. open sourced it. Well, cool. I'm I'm kind of curious, you know, what made you decide as you're releasing this tool? Like, was was open source sort of a strategic decision, or you just, you know, where you you figure you could get more users by doing that, or is it just you know kind of wanting contributions from the community, or could you talk through maybe uh, a little bit of your inspiration behind that? Yeah, yeah. So I think the biggest part is, you know, if it's something that touches their code, it's really important that the developer trust it by seeing, you know, what the code is like. You know, we're really open about what we do. And also the part on you know gathering the feedback from community is super super helpful. I feel like you know in general open source projects gets more you know feedback from the community. Yeah, with developer tools, it seems like a great way to encourage participation. That if you've got an open source project, you're inviting people to contribute. And mm-hmm. you know, our um, Opsi, our product, for example, it's you know it's closed. It's a SaaS application, and so we don't have the level of community support from developers that we'd really like in in some ways. Mm-hmm. And also you know. We hired an engineer from Docker because he was a maintainer, and he was super passionate about the project. So it really helps uh, in that front as well. Following from that, you you know you launched this to an open source community. Did you have an idea of the kinds of users you were targeting at that point? We sort of did um, from you know the, the original product that we have. So you know the Dropbox for a code product. So we had a sign up list. A lot of these users are more kind of lenient towards oh, willing to use UIs and prefer something simpler. The super active ones are actually consultants that work on multiple projects. Oh wow. Okay. And so that yeah, that's an interesting segment. So you know, people they're maintaining a lot of projects, they're looking mm-hmm. for an easy way to keep track of all that stuff. And so Kitematic fit that mold. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Docker kind of being isolated also provides that value. Yeah, and that too. So now, you know, if I'm maintaining multiple projects, I can have a uh, you know a Docker environment for each one, and the app makes it very easy to kind of move between those. Yep. And, and so, specifically, you know, the, the React UI and the GUI. What was it like having that be part of the open source project? Did you get contributions for that as well, or was that entirely internal? Uh, so the React UI, I think it kind of helped us in a way because uh, React is, according to Google Trend, almost on the same trajectory as as Docker. So there are a lot of people willing to work on something that's built in React. It was, you know, in a way accidental because you know, we thought it was a really good technology to use. Did you have any designers contributing to the project? We do have design-minded people, but not professional designers. Yeah, I mean yourself for example, you're now lead product designer at Docker and you I assume identify mostly as an engineer or you mm-hmm. know your background in coding. But you know, there's definitely this hybrid world in de- in the developer tool space. Yeah, definitely. In the beginning, what I kind of did is um, we had uh, hackathons, um, mm-hmm. and there were a lot, a lot of participants trying to um, add features to Kitematic, and then you know make a huge effort on you know kind of figuring out what is the right you know UI, right experience uh, to build there. And also by default, I think uh, what I wanted it's sort of like designing an OS. Uh, UI is very uh, extensible, and you want to figure out the right points where you can extend on it. You actually focus on like per component and really set an example of on how you ex, uh, extend the current UI. So when people contribute, they kind of follow that pattern, and then you only have to make uh, slight adjustments to it. And that seems true of open source projects generally too. You want to build mm-hmm. kind of a, a broad base that people can can build on top of and customize. Yeah, yeah. But you know the initial effort has to be really strong because otherwise uh, you will get uh, swayed by different opinions, and you know design by committee isn't mm. always a nice thing. Huh, that's pretty interesting. So I mean, you, you oftentimes see you know open source projects that are sort of no- notorious, espe- especially visually, for like like bad design or design by committee that ends up being you know, a little too weird. I mean, I can. Mm-hmm. Think of some Linux desktop managers that I won't name, <laughs> but uh, Kitematic is actually a yeah, it's a beautiful application. I'm, oh, I'm kind of curious how you managed to maintain that even when you're you know, kind of 
doing you know community driven design and I think a big part of it is keeping focus and actually willing to cut things you know in the in the beginning, Kitematic actually had a build you know you can actually build an image and then you know push it, but you know to uh, keep focus and make things simple before we figure out the next steps is actually making it you know run content only mm. and then so essentially uh, the focus of Kitematic was helping user install Docker on their computer. You know, visual way, it feels very reliable. Uh, we solved a lot of underlying issues with VirtualBox in the beginning. And then after that, you know, shows a beautiful catalog where you can click one button and run a container. And then, you know, that's kind of the experience we were aiming for and focused on. So it's super obvious what to do. Did you ever get pushback on those decisions from the community where you had to kind of assert your position strongly there? No, I think the community is mainly supportive, and what I kind of have to to manage was was um, you know people trying to add too many things that are uh, not focusing on that roadmap currently. Yeah, I think I remember you saying on the Software Engineering Daily podcast that you did end up cutting quite a few things from the product mm-hmm. um, after a bit of time. Can you talk more about that? You were trying to clean it up, or yeah, yeah. the The one thing that was cut was building images from it. Uh, even though it it's a super important thing, and we kind of decided to delay it because we want to do it right. Okay. Um, instead of you know releasing something super early, and then you know get set tra- sidetracked into different things, we want to you know keep focus until we figure out oh this is this is it, and then release that as as a whole. And you know talking about cutting more is you know the next version of Kitematic is sort of you know Docker for Mac. Mm-hmm. And it really solved the core issues that Kitematic was trying to solve in the beginning, is to install Docker reliably on people's desktop in a way that it almost feels like it's seamless. You don't feel like it's running inside a VM at all. And that was kind of the goal in the beginning. You install Docker for Mac, you, when you open the terminal, you, t- you can type mm-hmm. like, Docker, Docker run. It just works. And so had the Docker for Mac project begun before the Kitematic acquisition? Uh, it was uh, after the acquisition. Okay. Yeah. And so you were involved with that from the beginning. Yeah, I was uh, the founding member for Docker for Mac. Nice. So it's sort of interesting to think about. There's there's sort of an internal debate, I guess, with with most design questions of like customizability and configuration versus like limited options and this curated beautiful experience. And I feel like that happens even more with developer tools. So it seems like Kitematic and Docker for Mac and some of these tools are are definitely trending towards the latter there, where you're removing some of the optionality of Docker to make a a better user experience. I think that's, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I th- I think uh, the two tools are you know in a way more complementary. So how people usually use Kitematic is having um, the Kitematic UI side by side with the terminal. So. You know they like the transparency that they're getting from the Kitematic side, and you know the the sense of feeling reliable. Oh, I see things are running. I can check the logs uh, super easy. But on the other end, they um, they use the terminal is uh, how they used to work before, and that was sort of uh, expected in the beginning. And then you kind of go from there, right? You you never wanna like displace a tool that they're already using. They're so familiar with. So instead, you know, we kind of embraced that, but mm. made Kitematic more of a complementary to the Docker CLI. That's really interesting. I've seen similar comparisons made with GitHub and some of their tooling. So you know, GitHub has their Mac app and and their web UI and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I found myself going to them for things like diffs and comparison, merge states, like something where I want to grok like a lot of text or or you know get some status update, but. For actions, like if I want to do merges, like everything that I'm actually yeah. doing with it, I'm still doing through the command line. Mm-hmm. But I and mean, that's a really interesting comparison because it sounds like you've made the same distinction. Like to to view things, maybe you go mm-hmm. to the UI, but to actually take action, yeah, yeah. You know, GitHub Desktop is like a huge inspiration <laughs> <laughs> for all these decisions as well. Yeah, and I've never, I don't know, I've never really heard that distinction made this clearly. It's that you know that. There are certain things that developers are going to continue to want to do through the command line and through mm-hmm. terminal, but that we can make the experience better in some ways, like just figuring out whether a container is running or not. You know, yeah. it's really nice to have a UI to just see that all the time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and so that that kind of segues into development environments more generally, and like what 
the qualities of a good one are. And so we've kind of touched on some of those things already, like easy ways to see what the state of things are. Like what else mm-hmm. do you think makes a really good environment? Yeah, I, I think uh, like you mentioned, you know, the you know one of the biggest thing is uh, you know transparency into what is actually going on. And I don't think there are that many uh, prominent development environment out there. You know, like before uh, Docker, kind of Vagrant was uh, was very commonly adopted. It still is, but it really depends on if you can like set up a really good Vagrant file, <laughs> and then so then you can do that uh, every time reliably. And I think with with Docker is that you know now it almost works out of the box. You mm-hmm. know because you can. You know, run your images, run your services, and link them together, and reproduce them every time the same way. And I think having that consistency is super important to a development environment. And that that's a really interesting point because I think something about it it makes the timing of this feel very right that you're mm-hmm. able to do things with Docker that might maybe you couldn't do in in other places like Vagrant. Yeah, and and I think it kind of came in at the right time, right? With, with infrastructure as code. Uh, people are starting to put their configurations in GitHub and iterate on them, and you know Docker and Dockerfile kind of came along and made that super easy. So it's just yeah, incredible timing. Yeah, I mean, I think something I, I guess I would say personally that one of the most important things about a development environment is being as close to production as possible. Yep. Or yep. just like being able to recreate that environment and, and be really confident that what you do in development is going to work in production. And, and yeah, I mean, definitely Docker. I think hits a lot of those. All of those pain points for people. I mean, yeah, I used Vagrant before that, and yeah, you can definitely build a development environment in that. But it's uh, as soon as you want to go to production, now you're looking at maybe recreating that whole setup in another tool. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, the consistency between you know production environment and your development environment. Yeah, and I mean the timing also feels right because of everything else that's made that possible. Consistent environments, you know, developers now being able to manage their own infrastructure mm-hmm. and spin up cloud hosting for themselves that now, yeah, a developer can very easily set up these containerized environments and run them exactly the same way everywhere. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like just another reason that the timing of all this feels really good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I am curious, like, what other distinctions you draw specifically with Vagrant or other development environments, or like, are there any counterexamples, things you were trying specifically to not do? Mm. So, one thing I personally decided to avoid in the beginning is IDEs, mm. because you know there are a lot of tools out there already, developer already use, and IDEs tend to have a you know a harder learning curve in the beginning. And it will make a new tools much harder to adopt. And I think instead of displacing current tools, it's better to make a tool that is like a companion to what you're already using in the beginning. And then eventually you grow that tool and make it more and more powerful. Because you know you can't just <laughs> uh, you can't displace things you know all at once. It, it's kind of like a slower and more smoother uh, process. Yeah, and like you said too, there's already there are already a lot of development environments out there and so adding another one to the mix it, this feels fresh. It's a different approach where, you know, another IDE might not have gotten any that well and you might not have been able to do a lot of things that you've done mm-hmm. that way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's I mean, that's really interesting. It's a really important point, right? Like letting developers continue to use the tools that they already use is is so important. I, I mean, we basically, as developers, sit here and customize our tools and kind of go through this never-ending process of improvement and personalization on all these tools to make ourselves more productive or, or whatever. And if you completely, oh, now you can't use VI, like that throws away so much work that I've done on my own. Yeah, totally. And you know, things like Atom Editor, people have their plugins and everything set up. You don't want to like, mm-hmm. you know, the developers don't want to lose it. Yeah. Yeah, and at best, I mean, in some ways, you've achieved. Some of the best possible UX gains that you can have because it, it's sort of this invisible layer. It's just running all the time. You can very easily pull up status about your containers, and mm-hmm. you don't have to really do anything to achieve that. It's just this kind of helper yeah. that, that sits there and it's there for you if you need it. And if you don't need it, you don't even have to know it's there. Yeah, yeah. And in the in the you know the toolbox and Docker for Mac situation is you know you don't even have to have it open, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you can use the command line if you want. Uh, and then you can open the Kitematic UI to see what's going on if you want. You can use other things, for example, maybe our commercial products to see what's going on. It's like all up 
to the what the developer wants to do. Yeah, and so we've touched on a few points here already, but you know, so after the acquisition by Docker, now Kitematic is is it fair to say it's getting rolled into various parts of the Docker ecosystem, and so all roadmap mm-hmm. from here forward is is Docker apps. Yeah, yeah. Still, you know, some things TBD where it should fit, you know, if it should fit in Docker for Mac or other products is still uh, to be determined. And how big is the team that you're on now? So I'm actually I was on the Docker for Mac team. Now I'm on the enterprise team, and kind of looping back to what um, I mentioned about. Being a desktop app is super powerful. There, we are running into some challenges in how, for example, we have the universal control plane that you set up on a server to manage your uh, your cluster. But you know, how do you point a Docker cl- client to that? You mm-hmm. know, the the process right now is not as ideal as it should be. But you know, if there is a desktop client, it would be much easier because you can you know manage certificate and keys. I was just thinking that you might. Run into roadblocks in enterprise environments installing a desktop app on managed systems. Have you seen any challenges with that? So we're still in the process of exploring mm-hmm. this alternative. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen that in the past myself. Where it's just like web apps are actually a little bit easier for enterprise customers, just because it's sometimes getting a piece of software installed on on the desktop of a Fortune 500 engineer can be pretty challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking about that now. That um, I don't know. I remember in one of my first jobs, I had this laptop computer that they gave me, and I like added some MP3 files to my music folder, and then like the IT guy sent me a message <laughs> like, "Hey, we're delete those." And <laughs> yeah, and and I think you know, back in Kitematic days, I think the analogy I kind of wanted to be is you know, Kitematic is like you know VMware Fusion on your desktop, mm-hmm. and you know the web management dashboard is kind of vSphere. Mm-hmm. So you know, people were okay with that. So we're, that's why we uh, we want to explore this uh, this route. Yeah, that's a good point. And developers working in environments like that, this is a tool for them, and so they should get the access they need to run. Yeah, them. yeah. The question of what are you planning next feels a little dangerous now that it's part of the <laughs> Docker Enterprise roadmap. Um, but what I mean, what have been the most exciting things so far to customers, and and what are the areas that you really want to pursue most? Um, what's important uh, for customers right now is uh, integration with one Docker, the new Docker uh, orchestration. Uh, there's a lot of you know exciting things to do there. Things like uh, node management. You know you can request a node joining and then people can accept it. You know mm. how do you deploy and scale an application? All that the flow is figured out on the command line. But you know in terms of a UI and how it maps to pe- how people already work is very exciting. I really like the analogies that you made of like this being sort of a cross between Dropbox and the GitHub apps, mm-hmm. and that like integrating a lot of p- things that people are used to in the command line and figuring out ways to add value through you know a visual client and a desktop app. Yeah, yeah, it requires you know part of UX is you know researching users and figure out how they're actually using their command line tools, mm-hmm. um, and kind of adapt to that and. Create a product that complements what they're already doing. Huh, so that's interesting, and it kind of touches something we've talked about in a, a prior episode of this show. Where th- there's more than one kind of developer, right? Not everybody's the same, and especially mm-hmm. as you know, Docker's starting to approach like big enterprise and and you know some of these larger clients with, with the tools you're working on now. I think you're going to start to see a lot more of you know you have de- you know sort of raw developers. You may have very specialized ops people involved. There's sort of like all these different target audiences now for the stuff you're doing. I'm curious, you know, how do you how do you kind of you know, approach that? Do you actually you know, try and identify those subtypes of developers and, and target them differently with different kinds of interfaces, or or is it all really just sort of one set of tools that everybody uses? Yeah, it's like a tremendous amount of effort to research into those users, and in fact, you know, the design team is growing, and you know, user research is in becoming a, a criteria, and you know, we really want to do things right instead of. You know, just oh, when Docker one twelve is out, and then let's just add UI in it. It's not really, you know, we have a technology and slap on a UI. It's more about kind of having that in the whole product and user process uh, since the beginning. We are we're trying to you know take our time and do it right. Yeah, and really, what as you already said, rather than just 
taking the feature set that you're planning to mm-hmm. offer and slapping you on and like back that up with research, figure yeah. out why we need to do this and mm-hmm. what people are going to get most. Yeah, and you know, building personas for different kind of developers. And you know, one thing to to really watch out is you know the valley is a small place compared to the rest of the world, and a lot of the habit you know if you want to go big and target. You know, developers around the world. You don't have to necessarily cater around the developers、uh, that's in the valley. Did you find that a lot of your early traction with Kitematic was valley people?、Uh, it's actually pretty widespread, and so I look at you know the metrics is was it was dense in California,、mm-hmm. but also it was pretty well spread around the U.S. and Canada,、uh, Europe as well.、Mm. Uh, at one point, we actually picked up a, a Chinese and Japanese community. Nice, yeah. So it's it's actually just you know everyone loves、uh, simple tools.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that I mean that's another really strong benefit. I've seen even tools that I've worked on. I'm sad to say, like we've hit this plateau where because we were talking to our friends about it, and you know our friends are local, and we get this、mm-hmm. very like valley centric picture、yeah. of what people want, and that doesn't you know scale to the level that I'm sure you're looking at now.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the kind of persona here is about. Customizing, you know, like having like an open core, you can really extend on it.、Uh, but if you know not done right, it could actually get really complicated.、Mm-hmm. You know, people the rest of the world maybe they're working,、um, they have a day job that maybe they don't really like. You know, they go there, they want to learn something complicated. They just want to pick up something. Oh, this is super cool for what I do, and kind of figure out who that person is 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 super important、uh, for building the right product. Yeah, we all have these grand ambitions about,、mm-hmm. like, I can't think of a better way to say it than like a lot of times I've seen teams focusing on the knowledge that they have accumulated building some very technical product, and it's almost like they want to teach people about this stuff. But、mm-hmm. people, at the end of the day, people don't really care. Like, if you can make their lives easier and make their jobs easier, so they can go home earlier or whatever, yeah, that's going to win. And it sounds like you've got the right set of priorities there. Yeah, and you know the other thing is, you know, Valley is you know it's going big. I think one risk of building tools here is people might technical people might be tempted to build platforms off the bat, and that is you know super risky.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know you actually want to find you know like a small but very important problem to solve, and then kind of solve that first, and then slowly expand and. And build out the platform once you accumulate enough、uh, users and traction. Yeah, and not focus on locking people in. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of interesting to see. I mean, the evolution of sort of the Docker toolset, right? Like you, you end up starting off with sort of this really useful tool, and then basically every project that gets any level of success like that comes to the point where, like, now they've got this tool, but now the thing that they really need to work on is like, how do we get this thing onto people's computers?、Mm-hmm. I mean, whether it's like installers or or other projects, it's like. Usually, that ends up becoming the hardest part when you start wanting to kind of go wide with a tool. Yeah, I think、um, that's also another reason for being a desktop app is that it's super easy to adopt. Basically, you know, double click, download it, and double click opens and just installs Docker for you. Yeah, no SSHing or packages to run. Or- yeah, yeah. So makes it very like consumable, almost like a consumer app.、Right? Mm-hmm. Like I actually. Um, told my mom to try it out, and she could <laughs> she could start a she container on her Mac. <laughs> yeah, you know that's I think you know that's like the future, right? Is is everything is it's, it's not like developers, enterprise people, consumers. It's just easy enough that any user can actually do it. That's where I wanted to go with this before that we have this kind of idea that developers are somehow different than the rest of us, the the rest of people that they want something different from their tools. They're looking for some kind of complexity that maybe, but no, it's like you know, click install the same kind of simplicity that wins over consumer apps done right with a dev tool. I think you can get the same benefit. Yep, definitely. You know, it's all about understanding the users. <laughs> a lot of Products were built kind of from technology,、mm-hmm. and then think of the user. But you know, if it's actually the other way around, it's more likely to、uh, catch on with the users. Yeah, and just figuring out what people's pains are, and that's why、mm-hmm. research is so important. It's、yeah. you know, listening to people and figuring out what their big problems are, and、mm-hmm. and it's a wonder. I mean, it, you know, it all sounds so simple on the surface. <laughs> I mean, so few companies actually succeed in doing this, though. That's the that's the cool thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard. <laughs> it, it's sometimes you kind of need a balance. Because you know, Apple is like an R and D company, but 
it actually the product is actually very well catered towards uh, users. Yeah, and that getting the simplicity right that and this I guess just comes from focus. Like you, you clearly with a with a developer tool with something that it's a professional tool, it's something your customers are using to get a job done. They need power, they need control. There are some priorities that feel a bit different than a consumer app that's mostly focused on consumption, mm-hmm. but if you simplify in the right ways and focus just on the functionality that they need, it's like you're giving people this very constrained power. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's where the simplicity comes from. It's like everything I don't need is gone, but I have exactly the right amount of control that I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And one example, like, you know, GitHub for desktop. And there's this other awesome tool called Tower mm. for Git. Um, mm-hmm. They're very different and also cater towards different kind of users. You know, my assumption is that GitHub for Desktop is really focused on kind of newer Git users who are not so comfortable with the commands, so that they can drive more people into the platform and start using GitHub and and eventually learn Git and use it. You know, side side by side with the desktop app. Mm-hmm. And the product like Git Tower is actually more catered towards uh, professionals who are already using Git. And it offers, you know, powerful, more powerful features like, you know, rebase, uh, merging, and uh, merge from upstream, and all that. So, you know, very different. Also, all developers, but you know, it's actually different use cases mm-hmm. for different uh, settings. So it's super interesting. Yeah, that raises an interesting point too. That I mean, theoretically, GitHub or or Docker and Kitematic, even you could have multiple apps with different target audiences. I mean, this might not be the best way to deliver it, but. Even within the same set of functionality, given your target user, you might want to expose different you know, pieces of functionality and mm-hmm. different feature sets that might be intended for, as you say, a beginner user or an advanced user. Or yeah, so you know, you kind of have to know that right away. Otherwise, mm-hmm. for example, if GitHub for desktop is trying to get you know newer users, then they add you know complicated things like rebase merge mm-hmm. could be super dangerous if you mm-hmm. didn't do it well. And they'll be super confused what's going on, and then they'll actually might not use the tool. So it's, I think, a deliberate choice on, mm-hmm. on these two products. Yeah, I mean, it it also speaks to like you could find success theoretically with either of those as mm-hmm. long as you understand who you're designing for and why. Yeah, totally. Thanks again to our guest Sean Lee for coming by. And Sean, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? You can add me on LinkedIn or uh, follow me on Twitter. It's. Um, Lee Sean 106. L I S E A N 106. Yeah. That's about all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you have a DX topic you'd like us to dive into, you can reach us at dmmc at heavybit.com or on Twitter at don't make me code. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out the library. It's packed with amazing talks from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders.